Let's open our Bibles to Luke 21. We're looking at a prophetic series. We're looking at biblical prophecy. This is actually just the preamble. As soon as I get through Luke 21, we're going to launch into the ultimate explanation of the future and and spend a good time going through all of uh, the book of Revelation. But before we do that, Luke 21 talks about the end The end of time as we know it, the end of life as it comfortably is uh, in especially our world, which is uh, uniformitarian, which means they think that everything just kind of is just humming along and and gradually getting better. And of course, we know from the ending here that things are not just gradually moving along, but they're actually climactically headed, headed toward a dramatic and catastrophic ending. And that causes us, and and we're going to actually focus on the ending of this, starting in verse 31 in a moment. We're going to get there. But that makes us focus on the most precious commodity that all of us here together have, and that's our time. You and I have time. And God says when we live our time for him, by living and speaking for him, by living and serving him, by living and sacrificing for him, by living and worshiping him. When we live our time that he's given us for him, it's redeemed and it lasts forever. And this whole section, this this 21st chapter of Luke, is Jesus Christ's sermon warning that things are not going to go on as they always have, that there's going to be a dramatic, climactic, catastrophic, horrific finale, ending to everything. That made me think a lot this week about time. You know, we just went by New Year's, and time is different on New Year's Eve than any other time of the year. Most of the time, we we look at our watches as we're going somewhere. Driving, and we check to make sure we're going to be on time. Walking and checking, or waiting for someone, and and time is always about us moving. But it's interesting, if you think about it, on New Year's Eve, we stop, and we notice that it's time that's moving. And we can almost hear it going over the dam and dropping off in the distance and as it crosses the threshold into the new year we realize that the time that's passed is irretrievable you know i look up at the clock that's on the wall we are we are under the illusion that time repeats itself because the it, it's just hands that go around and around and you know if you don't get it done by eight o'clock today you'll have eight o'clock tonight and if you don't have eight o'clock tonight you'll have eight o'clock tomorrow morning and there's this illusion that time is an endless repetitive cycle and it's not it's linear And it's going one direction. And Jesus says, look, here's the ending. And we're all headed that way. And then he applies it when we get to verse 31. Well, time is marching unstoppably toward the end. The end of the world, the end of life, the end of days. And in Luke 21, we're opening the door to the future. Not what may happen, not what might happen, not what what probably could happen. This is actually the door to the future, and the Creator Himself is preaching a sermon, and He's speaking as He sees what's going to happen. That's why he, He breaks into tears at one point. And it says He wails, weeping, wails over the city of Jerusalem. He actually saw what was going to happen, happening to them. So this is not like a good movie we hope follows historic facts. This is actually Jesus seeing what's happening and preaching about it and recording it. And he says that he, as the judge of all, he is the one who will signal the end of days. And with the end in sight, he's seeing it. What does Jesus say we should be motivated to do? That's what he says at the end of his sermon. He actually has two imperatives that, that come up. In verse 31 is one, if you're a Bible marker, you know what an imperative is. It's a word in Greek, a verb, that they slap an ending onto so that it just jumps out. I mean, if you're Greek 
and you saw an imperative, it would just jump off the page. Kind of like if we put something in bold, you know, bigger case font and bright. You know, we just, if, if you're reading along a normal uh, black printed book and there's a, a letter that's about 10 times bigger than all the other ones and darkened, you know, it, it would stand out. Well, that's what happened in their mind when they saw an imperative. It was, it stood out. It was a, an expression of something that was to be considered. And Jesus in verse 31 says the first imperative... It says, so when you see these things happening, know the kingdom of God is near. That's an imperative. No. You have a responsibility. People who read the Bible, people who care about what God thinks, people who have the spirit of God within them. No. No. He commands us. So we should know. We should pay attention. And then the second imperative is the one we're going to spend more time on, and that's in verse 36. He says, watch. Another imperative. Watch. And we're going to examine that word because it's a very beautiful word. It's a word that we can understand even if you don't know Greek. If I said hupneo, it sounds like, well, it probably doesn't to you, but we don't have, uh, it's hypneo in English, hypnotize. It's the same word. And he says this word watch is a hupneo. A, alpha privative, means don't or not or no. Hupneo means being hypnotized being put to sleep, being lulled. He says, don't get lulled. Specifically, don't get lulled by the illusion that time is just cyclical and you, if, if it doesn't happen at noon today, it'll happen at noon tomorrow. And if we don't get it at noon tomorrow, we'll get it at noon next week because we have lots of time. We don't. The time you have this moment, you'll never have again. It's going by like water over a waterfall, never irretrievably irrevocably, inalterably gone. And Jesus is telling us prophecy, the end, should cause us to know and watch. And then the end of verse 36, or the end of the first line, and pray. Pray what? Pray always that you, you, not them, not us, you, he says you, Jesus is very good at application. Everyone kind of squirmed because they knew he he was talking. That you may be counted worthy not only to escape all these things, but to stand before the Son of Man. Well, he tells us at the end of his sermon, especially in verse 36, he warns us we can get mesmerized by life, hypnotized by time, and we can actually forget what we're here to do. God has allowed us in our culture to have this each year's final day. And I just want you for about two minutes to think about New Year's Eve, okay? Have you ever noticed the curious difference about time on New Year's Eve? Almost every other day of the year seems to be the same. But that night, that night it is brought home to us that time itself is moving. Usually we're moving, checking the watch as we move or the clock glancing at it. But on that night, we think about time moving. On New Year's Eve, we watch as time inexorably marches into the next year. On New Year's Eve, we can almost hear the stream of time beginning to murmur as it drops over the dam of that strange midnight hour. We become aware of the fact that we are not living in an endless repetitive cycle, but we are moving on a straight line of time and we can never retrace it. Now, because of instant playback and word processors and everything else and and our digital photography, we seem to think we can correct everything. You take a bad picture, that's all right. We just took a picture and my son altered it. We wanted a family picture and we were, I forget where, New York City or something, and he took the picture and he actually took himself and put it in the picture and he was not there. And no one will ever know. Except you, I just told you. But you know what? We just think we can alter anything. We can correct and... uh, and, uh, Adapt it to what we want. But life and time are so much reflected by that notion, that curious illusion that time is just going to just keep coming around and we'll have another opportunity. 
We have noon today, noon tomorrow, noon next week. We imagine that if we don't get something done, it'll be okay because we'll have another similar time tomorrow. And this illusion of time being circular and coming around each day makes us miss the fact that time is going by irretrievably. What we have done, what we have said, and what we have become, amazingly, God's Word tells us, has been unchangeably and irrevocably recorded. That means if in 2004 you made a bad decision, there's nothing you can do about it today. You can make a good decision today, but you cannot undo the bad decision that you made last year. It's gone. It happened. It's recorded. It's history. And we get uncomfortable about that in our society. We like to have, you know, no-fault insurance and no-fault divorces, and we like to get things just put away. But time is not so gracious. It captures exactly what we were, what we did, what we said, what we are, and freezes it. And it becomes a part of the past. Well... What we have done and said and been is irrevocably done and unchangeably a part of our past. Our steps cannot be retraced. Our mistakes cannot be undone. We cannot add what we missed. We cannot erase what we have done. It's final. Time is linear. Time is unstoppable. And we are headed to the end of not only our earthly days, but of earth's final days. And that's Jesus' theme. And that's what he's pointing out in Luke 21. In Luke 21, we see the end of everyone's life as it was. Time stops for them, life ends, and nothing is ever the same. It almost becomes Earth's final New Year's Eve. And I want you to think about that. You know, we, every year we get to have New Year's Eve, and, and the younger you are, the funner it is, and the older you are, the more sobering it is. When you think about how many you've celebrated and how many you may have to celebrate in the future. But Earth's final New Year's Eve, this is what the sudden intervention of Christ into human affairs seems to be. Luke 21, this record of the end, seems to be like a final New Year's Eve for the whole world. Although they don't even know it. They're just at the party. It's when men become aware that life has been lived and whatever it is and will never be any different, it's settled. See, the people in this this little passage here didn't know it was going to end. They kind of were in the illusion that they could reform and they'll change and someday they won't do that anymore and they'll make that right. And they didn't realize God was going to stop everything and that he was going to reveal what they really were and that it was too late. As we saw last Sunday, What good is it to say I'll kneel before you when you're flat on your face and can't move because you're in the presence of an infinite holy God that you have rejected your whole life? And he says it's too late. What good does it do to say when I get there I'll change when you're paralyzed with fear and can't change? And so no one can go back and change a life that's lived. And that leaves us facing the inevitable question how long is it You've lived. Oh, we say, I'm so many years old. But that's not the right answer. Because the scriptures say that no one really starts living until they know Jesus Christ, and they only are truly living when they're living in his power and for his glory. Think about that. For to me, to live is Christ. And when I live in Christ, dying is gain. In our culture, dying is definitely not gain unless you have bone cancer and they're in such horrible, excruciating pain you just want it over with. And you get Dr. Uh, Kevorkian or whatever his name is to hook you up and get rid of you because you just can't stand it anymore. But for most people, dying is not gain unless you are absolutely hopeless. For the rest of us, living is everything. And we haven't defined life the way God does. For he tells us, 
that real life is tied to Jesus. And the only part of life that can be called living is the time you have been watching for your Lord's return. In the strength of his abiding life, all else is really death. That's why he says in verse 36, watch and pray that you may be counted worthy. You know, Jesus is giving a powerful, powerful warning. He says, if you don't watch it, you're going to get mesmerized. You're going to be hypnotized. You're going to be hypnotized, thinking that you have endless time and you're just going to do it tomorrow. I'm going to start that reading plan, or I'm going to start loving, or listening, or praying, or I'm going to start, you know, tomorrow. And tomorrow never comes. And Jesus says, watch out. Don't get hypnotized by the illusion of time. It's fast approaching the end. Luke 21 is Christ's call to live deliberately, to live purposefully, to plan to live in such a way that the way we live counts to God, not to us. We like to measure our life by what we have accomplished. And in the church, you're supposed to come and say, what has God accomplished? Not what have you accomplished? We can do all kinds of stuff. Look around the world. It's littered with what's left behind by countless people who have done all kinds of stuff that doesn't matter, and it's all, as our verse says, going to be dissolved. Is the vast majority of what you spent your life doing going to be dissolved? That's the question Jesus asked. Real life is tied to Jesus, Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Life is fragile, as James puts it. What is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Time can be purchased, though. Time can be purchased for God. It says in Ephesians 5 and verse 16, redeem the time because the days are evil. And if Paul thought they were evil 2,000 years ago, they're more evil today. Paul only knew about the evil that was going on in his little corner of the Roman Empire. And the evil he heard about it as he traveled and his travelers came through Ephesus where he wrote that. Today you and I can see all the evil. The 1,424 murders today, you can read about all of them if you want to. There's a website that lists off where they were murdered and how, and you can read all the grisly details. And we get so conditioned by that that we forget how evil our world is. And if the world is evil, Paul says, redeem the time. Life from God overflows with purpose and meaning, John 10.10. I am come that you might have life and that you might have it overflowingly. That means you can overflow for God, whether you're young or old, whether you're mobile or impaired, whether you're fragile or in the peak of your strength, whether you have all kinds of possessions or nothing at all. You can overflow because it's not tied to your material state or possessions or power. It's tied to what's within you, the abundant overflowing life of Christ. John 10.10 tells us. Also, Jesus is the author of real life. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. You want real life? It's only tied to me. That's why Paul says that everybody else in the world is dead in their trespasses and sin. Dead. You're not alive until you come to the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. And you only redeem and live truly when you live for him who loved you, 2 Corinthians 5, and gave himself for you. That's life. Also, Life is knowing God. Death is not knowing God. This is life eternal, John 17, 3, that they may know you, the only true God, even Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So, just before we read Luke 21, 31 to 36, let me ask you again. How long have you lived? Not how old are you. That's just how close you are to death, how many years you've you've been here. How much of it have you lived for Christ? That's the only thing that counts as life. And so we should truly ask ourselves, how much of my life will abide the day of his coming that we're reading about here? How much of it, as Peter says in the verse we're memorizing, is going to get dissolved? And how much of it is going to get deposited and kept 
and be reserved for us eternal in the heavens. You see, we all have the same precious commodity. We have the same 60 minutes an hour time moving by at that speed. It's going by 60 minutes an hour. We all get the same flow, but we do different things with our time. And he's saying, think about it. Whatever is not gold, silver, and precious stones, which comes from activity of Christ's life in us, is nothing more than hay and wood and stubble, as Paul calls it, consumables. How much of your life is consumable? It's going to be burned up. You know, in in textbooks, they have the consumables. Those are the paper workbooks that they just throw away. Then they have the the heavy-duty textbook that's going to be used again. We're so prone to live our lives like consumables. I don't mean consumed for the glory of God. I mean just thrown away because we have 8 o'clock tomorrow. We have 8 o'clock the next day. We don't have our devotion today. We have them tomorrow. We don't have memorized that verse this week. We'll have next week. And time, the illusion of the do it anytime you want, that circle going around and around hypnotizes us. And Jesus says, don't be hypnotized. Well, verse 31, no, he says, he commands us, know what's going on. And then in verse 36, he says, watch. Don't get hypnotized, he says. Don't go to sleep. Be awake. Be alert. Don't get caught unprepared. Let's read what Christ says. And I'm going to read Luke 21, 31 to 36, and ask the Lord to uh, wake all of us up. Verse 31, so you also, when you see these things happening, know, I command you, that the kingdom of God is near. Verse 32, assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away. Everything you see is going to be dissolved. But my words will by no means pass away. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousings and drunkenness and cares of this life. And that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell in the face of the whole earth. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Let's bow before him right now. Father in heaven, we bow before you and your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus. And we pray that you would help us to be delivered from the illusion of time. Thinking, oh, we have the spring. We don't have to worry about that till the summer. Or we'll attend to that this fall after the good weather's passed. Or when the new year starts. And we just have this illusion that we have endless time to get about what you want us to do. And you're telling us, no, don't get hypnotized. Wake up to the fact our lives are going fast. And only what is done for you in the power of your spirit and for your glory is going to last. And the only thing that matters in heaven is what lasted on earth. And I pray we wouldn't just consume our days here with the cares of this world and with all the minutia that doesn't matter. Help us to focus on you and your kingdom and your rule and reign and glory in our lives. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want you just to focus with me on verse 36 because I love what Jesus gives us as a solution. I mean, don't you like the solution? You know, I love to, to hear people, you know, go on and on about all the problems. You know, got to have this problem, this problem. And I always go, you know, uh-huh. If, if you aren't going to tell me the solution, I don't need to hear about all the problems. What's the solution? We're supposed to, to have the solution. And Jesus says, here's the solution, verse 36. Watch, therefore, and pray always. Now, let me give you a little secret to studying the Bible. One of the greatest things you can do in Bible study is before you attack the books, and I love books and I have thousands of them, and I add constantly to my books. But the first course, the first thing I do, I mean, my hand just twitches whenever there's a verse I'm wondering about. I can't wait 
to start looking up the words. Because the best commentator on the Bible is the Bible. God comments on what he means within this book. Because this is a supernaturally engineered book, and every part of it is there by divine design. Okay, so if you're looking at verse 36, and you say, uh, watch therefore and pray always. That's a pretty heavy thing. Jesus is concluding this huge sermon with this simple application. Watch. I already told you about watch. Watch is an admonition from two words, a Greek form, an alpha privative, which means not. The second word is the word we get hypnotized from in English. In Greek, it's hupneo. When you put them together, ah, hupneo means to avoid allowing the world around you to lull you to sleep. And by the way, it's a present active imperative, which means constantly, constantly, I command you, don't get put to sleep. So, okay, you got our attention, Lord. How do we not get put to sleep? Well, that's the pray part. He says, pray. Watch and pray. And he doesn't just say pray. He says, pray always. Well, if you're a comfortable, well-adjusted American reader, you say, hmm, pray, I know what that is. Now I lay me down to sleep. You know, I pray the Lord my soul to sleep or keep and whatever because I was never good at praying that when I was little. I forget the words to it. But we know about pray. No, no, it's not that easy. If you stop and think about it, pray is used a lot in the Bible, but there are seven different original words that the Holy Spirit inspired that have been rendered in English, pray. But there are seven different words. Isn't that fascinating? But comfortable, well-adjusted readers, we just think we know all about prayer. You know, it's just, you know, bow your head and say something. Well, that's not what this word is. It's not that. In fact, uh, pray is one of seven words used for prayer. It means to earnestly seek the hand of the Lord in a time of need. Luke uses this word in his two books. Remember, Luke wrote two books. This is the the prequel, and then the sequel is, is Acts. So Luke and Acts are a pair. And in those two books, 15 times of the 22 times this word for prayer is used, Luke uses them. He liked this word. He, he captures it against the backdrop of Christ's ministry. The dictionary defines this word, which, by the way, is the word deomai, deomai, actually is how you'd say it, deomai, as to want, desire, long for, ask, beg, I like that one, beg, pray, and make supplications. Now, you say, well, how do you get that out of it? Well, turn back. This is what I meant. Look at Luke chapter 5. I'm going to give you what is one of the most thrilling parts of Bible study for me, tracking down what God means by what he says, okay? Instead of me saying, oh, I think, or to me it means this, what you do is your first course is to look back and see if God has ever spoken about this before and what he said when he spoke about it. And let me show you what I mean. In Luke chapter 5, we're looking at what does, when Jesus concludes this huge, monumental, the longest sermon he ever made on the end times and on the end of the world, he concludes it by saying, don't get hypnotized and do this all the time. And we're looking at the do this all the time part because that's what we should want to do. And he's saying, do this all the time. And we think we know what pray means, but we're not sure. So when else does Luke use it? Well, Luke 5, 12. And it happened when he was in a certain city that, behold, a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus, and he fell on his face and deomied him. There is that word, deomai. Now, in, in the New King James, it says, and implored him. You ever had leprosy? Probably not. It was the most dreaded, feared disease of the ancient world. Because they didn't know where it came from. All they knew is what it did. They didn't really know what it did. Actually, we know now it's it's Hansen's disease and it, it kills nerves. That's all it does. It doesn't eat stuff away. We do that. What happens is the, the leper slowly loses feeling in their extremities. It usually starts in the extremities. Ears, nose, fingers, toes. And what happens is they lose all feelings, and formerly when you would grab the, the handle of your cooking instrument, you'd go, ah, and you'd go get a rag and wrap it around. But the leper grabs the handle, just burning their hand away. They don't feel a thing. They've lost feeling. And they pull away and they go, oh, man, my skin's loose. I wonder why that is. They didn't feel anything. And their toes, they stub them and break them, and finally they end up walking on top of their toes. And they actually wear their toes off because they've lost feeling. 
And their ears, they get cold, they get bit, they, they scrape them with their hands or brush or their nose gets, gets hurt and they don't feel it. And they gradually, it gets cut and infected and they don't feel the, and it just, and that's what so, that's why lepers would lose their faces because infection was in their ears and their fingers. They would actually wear them off. And lots of other things would happen, especially in a climate where you don't have, you know, pest control and vermin control. If you can imagine, uh, you know, if something bit you in the night, you go, ah, you know, and you scurry it away. But if you're without feeling and something bit you in the night, it could just bite you as much as it wanted. And actually, in leper colonies, their biggest problem is that the rats eat the extremities of the people in the leper colony. It's just horrible. That's why the Bible says leprosy is a picture of sin. Sin deadens us. We should go like that when we're on something evil, but sin has deadened us that we can't feel the damage it's doing to our soul. That's why leprosy is a picture of sin. Well, if you had leprosy and thought someone could heal you, you'd lost your fingers and toes and ears and nose and, and, and face, and you thought the only person with a cure was in front of you, and you got to fall on your face, how would you talk to him? That's what this word means. It's not a ho-hum, hold your cup of coffee and say, hey, got any time, you know, I got a little problem here. This guy implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now think about imploring Okay, keep going to chapter 8. Turn over a couple of pages because Luke loves this word. I told you it's 15 of the times he uses, and every one of them is as colorful as this one. Luke eight twenty eight. another uh, incredible account. This is the time it's the demon-possessed man. And Luke eight twenty eight says, When he, the demon-possessed man, saw Jesus, he cried out, he fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of Most High God? De o my, I beg you, do not torment me. Now here is this demonized fellow, this demon inside of a human, driving this human body all over the place and making it do all kinds of awful things. And since demons are not omnipresent or omniscient, nor can they sense everything that's going on, they're very localized, they just are part of whatever Satan's got them doing right then. This demonized man, driven by the demon, is just flopping all over the place, and one day it flops itself in front of someone, and as the demon looks out through that man's eyes, he goes, It's him. God. You are the judge. You are the one that cast Satan out and you're the one that's going to put us into the lake of fire see the, do you see the level of intensity this demon uses the word that Jesus tells us to have in our talking to him that Luke records through inspiration of God's spirit that, that the amount of intensity of a demon not wanting to be thrown in the pit is the level of intensity we should be asking God to make us live our lives to count for him. He says, I beg you, deomai, I, I plead with you, I, I earnestly, fervently, please, don't do it now. Hmm. Keep going to verse 38. Now the guy is free from the demon. It was a demon beg. And let's see how the guy does. Luke eight thirty eight. Now the man from whom the demons, they were many, had departed, begged him. There's the same word. The word pray in chapter 21, verse 36, is right here. It's begged Jesus. That's the hymn. Begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away and said, hey, you... you you have something else you can do for me, and he did a great job. That's a great story I won't get into. Do you see the intensity? This man, delivered from the force of these demons that had driven him around, now sees the deliverer, and he begged him. He says, I want to stay with you. I, I long with all that I am. Not like, well, if I get around to it, I'll find a little time for you, God. This man begged Jesus. That, that's a, a real picture. Look at 938, chapter 9, verse 38. Luke uses the word again. And 
again, I want you to see whether it's a leper falling on his face or a demon hating the pit or a demon-delivered man wanting to stay with Jesus because of the safety and power and protection. Or look at 938. This is a, a parent. And look what it says in 38. Suddenly a man from the multitude cried out and said, Teacher, I, and here's the word, from Luke 21, 36. I implore you, Daomai, look on my son. He is my only child. Now, do you have children? Can you imagine what if you only had one child and that was all your hope in this world? Back then, they just lived for their children because they were going to get old and there was no social net and there was no government and there was no nothing and, and they had to live with their children. Their children would help feed them. Their children would be there to close their eyes and bury them in the family. I mean, they, everything was, you had to have a child and you hoped that they would survive. But this one isn't. And behold, verse 39, he's not surviving. A spirit seizes him. And he suddenly cries out, it convulses him, so he foams at the mouth, and it departs from him with great difficulty, bruising him. And so I implored your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Back to verse 38. I implore you. Can you imagine the intensity a father with his only child who's being terrorized by those demons, how he would look up at Jesus And can you imagine the intensity of the way he would ask for something from the Lord? That's Luke 21, 36. That's the level that we are to get at, realizing how fast time is going by, how climactic and catastrophically it shall end, how irretrievably and irrevocably it is gone and we cannot alter it, and we beg the Lord that we not get hypnotized thinking we've got endless sweeps around the face of the clock and we'll get it done someday. And we start begging God, how can I be counted worthy to stand before you? We've already looked at what that big scene's going to be like, what it's going to be like with the redeemed of all the ages and all the angelic hosts and all those creatures and the lightnings and everything else. And we're begging him that we be worthy to stand before him and to give him something. It's the same intensity this, this dad has for his only son. Look at chapter 10. I mean, I could, I could do this all day. It's so much fun. See how much fun Bible study is? Look at 10, 2 of Luke, okay? Next chapter. Then he said to them, the harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, and he uses the same word. What we're supposed to pray for the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest is not supposed to be a, oh, Lord, if you want to, you can. But it's begging God to send laborers into the harvest field. You know, when you think about everything your children could do, you know, you could send them to Stanford or Oxford or Yale and they could become a Rhodes Scholar. Have you factored in how useful they're going to be to God You know, sometimes we steer our children incorrectly. We prepare them socially and academically and athletically and in the arts, and we don't prepare them to be useful for God. And you know, we should be begging God, do you want my children to go forth to be laborers in the harvest? Do you want my children to go and live in Mexico City in a tin top hovel and, and learn Spanish and minister to those who've never heard the gospel? Do you want my children to become a tent making English teacher in China somewhere and live way out where they still fertilize with human excrement and it's a horrible place to live, which is what China is like? If you've ever been there, you can smell their fields a mile away. But do you want my child to do that? See, this is a pretty intense thing. Beg the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. If you're really doing that, you usually begin with those closest. Do you want them to go? Do you want me to go? Most of us could live the rest of our lives in a third world country quite quite ably. If you're not deeply in debt and you liquidated, most of us have more than 90% of the population the world will ever have. It's 
amazing thought. Here's the last one. Look at Luke 22, 32, and then we'll back up to 21. Here's the last time it occurs in this book, and it's actually Jesus. And you can see his intensity. Luke twenty two thirty two. Jesus is talking about Peter. And this shows you how Jesus ever lives to make intercession for us. And how does he do that? Luke twenty two thirty two. But I have deomai. I have interceded. I have supplicated. I have begged. I have sought God for you, Peter, that your faith should not fail. And it's not going to. Because he says, and when you have returned to me... Strengthen your brethren. We'll look back at Luke 21, 36. You're in 22. Just look back across the page. Life is difficult at times. Verse 34 of Luke 21 says, Watch out, you don't get weighed down. Lest your hearts be weighed down. With all the carousing and drunkenness and cares of this life. Carousing, shopping around for a thrill. That's what carousing is. You're just looking for a party where you can just get an up, you know. Drunkenness, anything to make you forget your problems. Alcohol is one of them. Other people are addicted to amusement. I went to school with a guy that was addicted to, he, he, just, he would drive endlessly to go on, on roller coasters and, and fast rides. It's the only thing that kept him from being weighed down and he was just he just didn't want to think about his problems he just had to have amusements and thrills doesn't matter what it is it's not all alcohol drugs lots of stuff but don't get weighed down he says with the cares of this life why because if you are you'll slowly verse 36 get hypnotized you don't want to get hypnotized thinking that this life is for me to live any way I want to live it, and the way I live it is fine, and I'm going to go to heaven because I'm saved, and so I'm just going to do what I want here, and my kids are going to do what they want, and we're just going to have the most comfortable, convenient, secure life possible on earth. God says, you're hypnotized. You should be, verse 36, praying always that you be counted worthy to escape and stand before me. You should be imploring me like the father whose son was demonized. You should be imploring me like the man whose body was being eaten up by leprosy. You should be imploring me like a demon who is scared to death of the pit. You should be imploring me that you know how to live your life in a way that will count forever. When we come back to this, I'm going to talk to you because God is real simple what he wants. And I'll tell you about it, and then we'll study it next time. God says, I collect all of your prayers. If God collects, you know, my mom used to collect all the letters I wrote her from college. So you know what that made me do? It made me send her a few extra because she liked them so much. God says, I collect all of your prayers. So what should we do? Pray, Right? God says, I multiply sacrificial gifts. Not just gifts, gifts that cost you something. So what should we do? Give. God says, I count souls that you lead to me. That you're a part of the process of them coming to faith. I collect those. And I'm going to reward you if you do that. What should we do? Win people to Christ. He says, I remember humble service you do. That you do totally humbly without anybody commending you for it. So what should we do if God really honors that? Serve. Serve. And he says, I love those who go out and seek those who are lost and poor and needy and downtrodden. I love you to go in my name. And take my name and my love and my message. You know what we should do? Go. He said, I like your prayers, pray. I like you to give, give. I like you to serve, serve. I like you to go, go. You see? So simple. You can't go back and live last week. It's gone. But you can, on the first day of the new week, decide... How much of this week are you going to live for Christ? Look back at chapter 18 and I'll close because, you know, there's some of you that have been sitting there and scratching your heads and you say, you know what? 
I don't even get this. You know what I like about Luke? Luke records, if there's ever a formula in the Bible for a person what they said to get saved, Luke records it in chapter 18. Did you know that? And Jesus comments on it, okay? Because some of you don't know how to redeem the time. You don't even know what I'm talking about because you don't even understand this because you're not even sure you know that Jesus is coming back and the world's going to end. In fact, you don't even like talking about death because it certainly isn't gain for you. And that condition, Jesus addresses in Luke 18. And he talks about a churchgoer, two churchgoers or temple goers. And the one was smug and comfortable and self-righteous and he measured his going to heaven by what he had done. And what he says is, in, in Luke 18, there was in a certain city a judge who, who didn't fear God and didn't fear man. And he said, get justice for me. And there was a widow, and her continual, by her continual weeping, I'm sorry, get down to verse 9. I don't want to tell all this. I want to get down to the, the two men. I started too soon. Look at verse 9. He spoke a parable of them who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Here's the two to uh, temple goers and despised others the two men went up to the temple to pray one a pharisee and the other a tax collector and the pharisee stood and prayed and he said with he he said thus with himself i mean he's kind of talking to himself but he's praying i guess god i thank you that i am not like other men so i i tell how good i am because i'm not as bad as them he extorts he's unjust that one's an adulterer and I'm not even as bad as that one. He points the tax collector next to him. I fast twice a week, and he was proud of it. I give tithes of all that I possess. I, I, am a, you know, I pay my tithe. Look at verse 13. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven. That means he was uncomfortably aware of his sinfulness. But beat his breast... That means he was very sorry. And in the presence of God, he says, I am guilty. I, I can't even look at you, God. Can you just feel the emotion of this man? But here's his prayer. I love this. And if you ever want a prayer to pray, here's the one the Bible has. So it's interesting. There's only one time someone's told what to say to be saved. And that's, Luke also records that in, in Luke 16. The only time we hear an actual salvation commanded prayer is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And the only time we have a record of one is right here. This is the only time we have a record of what someone said when they were actually brought into the kingdom. And this man said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So that contains the content necessary. And look what Jesus, this is Jesus' commentary. I mean, you want to know if this man made it? Look at this. I tell you, Jesus continues, that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Emphasis on justified. This morning, you want to know the prayer that God hears? He doesn't hear the vast majority of all the prayers going on in the world, he only hears the prayers from his own and from those who come to him and say, God, be merciful to me. You're the only hope I have for salvation. You're my only hope. I can't even look at you. I don't deserve anything. I'm not worthy of anything. But God, you can extend mercy to me. Be merciful to me the sinner. This morning, if you are not sure you're going to stand before Christ, you can be. Jesus commented here that that kind of attitude he'll never resist. All who come to me, I'll never cast out. If you have never cried out to the Lord, maybe you've just said, well, I'm not a drug addict. I'm not, I'm not some licentious, wicked, immoral, one of those. I go to church and I give. And God says, that doesn't count. Have you ever, unable to look up at me, said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Let's bow before the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you that you give us lessons on the end of the world. 
And those lessons are reminders that time is going by irretrievably gone. And we're so thankful that all who do cry out to you and ask for your mercy, that you wipe out all of our sins, the cloud. You cleanse away all the defilement. You erase all of our trespasses against you. And in their place, you cover us with the robe of Christ's righteousness. All that for your mercy and grace are so rich and so free. Lord, I pray that any who have never prayed from their heart, humbly, would say to you, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And for all of us who do know you, may we beg you today that we live in such a way unhypnotized by time that today we actually want to live for you. We want to start those things we want to do someday. We want to start them now and we want to not quit. And we want to be in your word and we want you to be living through us and we want to have your love and your spirit. And I pray that we will be ready to stand before you. And we ask that now in the name of Jesus and for his glory. Amen.